Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. This episode is a recording of a panel that took place over homecoming weekend. Six alumni who awarded Fulbright fellowships to teach or do research in Nepal, Argentina, Spain, and the Czech Republic share how their experiences change their lives and inform their career paths. You will hear from Alana Smith, class of 14, Emily Kennedy, class of 15, Vince Whalen, class of 15, Kelly Garland, class of 16, Abby Guarino, class of 16, and Jennifer Dorn, class of 18. The panel was hosted by Dr. Dara Maldari, Director of National and International Fellowships in the Center for Engaged Learning. And shortly after World War II, um, the U.S. State Department, uh, through the funding originally bestowed by Congress and annual renewed, funds a host of programs that fall under the Fulbright International Exchange umbrella. So Fulbright programs in general are the flagship programs of intercultural exchange for the United States of America. The purpose of today's panel is to talk about one of the Fulbright programs that affects our students the most. It's the US student program. Um, There are a couple of options in that program, and I'm going to run through those before you get to hear from PC alums who have received funding for a Fulbright year, spent a Fulbright year across the ocean after they graduated from here in another nation across one or other oceans. Um, But the programs that we're going to talk about today are those that give graduating seniors or alums who've been out five to seven years, give them basically a lower middle class to middle class stipend to live for nine to 10 months in a nation that they've applied to go to. So you pick one nation, they don't place you, you ask for a certain nation. And there, you either do research or study. Research is an independent research project you've designed as a graduating senior or recent alum, or you're funded in a one-year master's program in that nation, you've designated in your application which you're going for, or you serve as an English teaching assistant in a classroom in that nation. And if you do the English teaching assistantship, it's just a 20 to 25 hour commitment every week, and you're expected to do something outside that that is fitted to your interests and talents as a volunteer. So maybe eight hours a week doing something musical, or maybe you're doing after school tutoring. And our alums today will talk about their community engagement project if they were an English teaching assistant. Your first opportunity to apply is the fall of your senior year. And if you receive the grant, you would start the following year. In most nations, you'd start in September and do an academic year, nine to 10 months. In some parts of the world, you don't start till the following January because their school year starts in January, okay? So I've already told you this, but I'm going to read off this slide, those particulars. So English teaching assistant awards place grantees in schools overseas to supplement local English language instruction. And you don't have to be an English major to apply for this, okay? Open study research awards were the original Fulbright awards. They're the traditional. And most people who get it are doing an independent research project. And Emily Kennedy today is the one person we have on this panel who did an independent research project. So she'll be telling you about that. I'm going to turn things over to the panel because most of all today, I want you to hear their voices. Um, But does anyone have any questions before I turn things over to them? Um, How we're gonna do this is I'll have each panelist introduce him or herself. And then I'm going to ask a series of questions, five or six questions. And after each question, each panelist will answer. So first introductions. And they know what to do. So, hey, this is 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 our, our, who just, now, just so you know, these panelists, I think, have all traveled, right? You've all traveled to be here. And they've all graduated from PC within the last six years and all have gone on in the year following or two years following their graduation to do the Fulbright experience. Okay, go ahead. Hello. 
Is the mic working? Hopefully. Uh, my name is Alana Smith, um, class of 2014. I got a, a bachelor's degree in creative writing from PC, um, and I did an English teaching assistant Fulbright in Nepal from 2014 to 2015. Um, I was uh, situated right outside of Kathmandu, um, and it was a wonderful time, I'll tell you all about. And uh, right now I live in Boston. I'm a copywriter, and I'm a full-time grad student. Hi, I'm Emily Kennedy, and I'm, I graduated in 2015. I studied global studies here at PC, and um, I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina, doing a research grant uh, studying access to water outside the city of Buenos Aires. And now I'm living in Philadelphia, and I'm a student um, at Penn studying city planning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vince Whalen. I graduated in 2015 with a double major in econ and Spanish. Um, I completed my Fulbright English teaching assistantship in Madrid, Spain. Um, I also, uh, following my grant, I also earned a Master of Public Policy degree from Duke University. And now I live in Washington, D.C., where I am a uh, government consultant at Deloitte. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Garland. I graduated uh, Providence with my Bachelor's of Arts in Global Studies in 2016. Um, and then I did my Fulbright in the Czech Republic in a small village called Nova Paca, about an hour and a half, two hours outside of the capital of Prague. I finished my bachelor, uh, rather my master's degree um, of education in counseling focused in higher education at Providence College. That one year gap just couldn't keep me away, apparently. <laughs> Um, and now I work at Merrimack College as an assistant director of admission where I do international and domestic recruitment. Hi everyone, um, I'm Abby Garino. I graduated from PC in 2016 with a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing and Spanish. Um, I did my English teaching assistantship in Madrid, Spain, um, same as Vince, and I was uh, teaching there in a high school. Um, now I live in Boston and I'm a senior access advisor um, for a nonprofit called Bottom Line and we help first-generation families with the college process. Hi, I'm Jennifer Dorn. I graduated in 2018 uh, with a degree in English and theater, um, and then I did a year in the Czech Republic as an ETA in the small town of Zabřeh, um, and I just got back um, this is June, and I am now doing Teach for America in Connecticut, and so I'm a ninth grade English teacher in Hartford. Um, and just to give you a little context on this marvelous panel, there have been 16 students from Providence College since the program started in the 1940s. There have been 16 who got a Fulbright using the PC campus endorsement process. 10 of those 16 have been in the last five years. And just this past cycle, three PC seniors from last year's class were awarded Fulbrights for this coming year, two in the Czech Republic, like Jen, and she must have done marvelously, because, and, and Kelly too, because they, they want us in the Czech Republic, and we also have um, someone going to Malaysia starting this January. Um, so, first question for the panel, why did you apply for a Fulbright grant, and why did you choose the nation you went to? So I spent a lot of my uh, kind of childhood and high school years tutoring at my local library. And I always dreamed about going abroad and teaching English abroad because um, childhood literacy is one of my passions. So when I looked into Fulbright and realized that there was the English teaching assistantship grant, I thought, well, why not? I, I should give it a try. I'm not sure what I'm going to do after I graduate, and this would be an incredible opportunity to give back. And I really, I try to come up with a reason why I picked Nepal. All I can say is that one day I was in the chapel, I was thinking about this, I was praying about this, and it just came to me that Nepal was the country I needed to go to. I love the mountains. I just it seemed like this kind of mysterious, magical, and spiritual place. And um, I, I just decided, you know what, that's it. That's where I'm going to apply to, and I'm so happy that I did. So I picked uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, because I studied abroad there my junior year at PC, this 
spring semester. Um, I did a program with SIT, and as part of SIT's program, they um, require you to do a research project for a month. And so I did a research project on access to water in this community, and I really enjoyed it. And um, I was not super interested in teaching English, and I thought that I, I really like um, – like the journalistic side of like interviewing people and um, doing that kind of research. So I, that's what made me interested in applying to the re research one specifically. And I wanted to do a project that was like more in depth of what I had done um, during study abroad. So I love my time studying abroad in Buenos Aires and I wanted to go back. So I had actually heard about the Fulbright program in high school. I had a uh, high school world history teacher who uh, by the time I met her, she had completed three Fulbright teaching grants. Uh, there's a Fulbright program that's for teachers, and so she had done three different summer programs. And so she had always told me about what the program was and encouraged me that when I was old enough that I should apply. And so I started working with Dr. Mulderry um, after my junior year ended and, you know, ended up choosing Spain because I had a Spanish major, but I actually didn't study abroad in Spain. Um, I studied abroad in Copenhagen, Denmark, which is why would a Spanish major go to Denmark? <laughs> um, it's because I was a double major, and so I completed a lot of my econ credits in Copenhagen. Um, and so since I missed out going abroad to Spain as a junior, I really wanted to go to Spain at some point, and I felt like the Fulbright program was a great place to do that. Um, and I decided on teaching because I felt that PC had really prepared me to be a good writer and a good communicator, and I felt that the teaching role would be a good fit. So I was really involved with uh, Student Congress when I was here as an undergrad. I was um, the vice president of my class my first two years, and then my class president um, my final two years. And I really enjoyed um, being a voice for my classmates and my peers, especially sitting on different board of trustees committees um, and other things around campus. Um, so when I was trying to think of what I wanted to do for my next step, I spent a lot of my time reflecting on my short-term study abroad program. Um, I went to the Czech Republic. I went to Prague um, for eight weeks during the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And the final two years of PC, all I could think about was how can I get back there? I never felt so at home in a place um, in my entire life other than here. So I felt like that was really my calling. Um, as a global studies major, I was really fortunate to kind of know some upperclassmen, including Emily, who were starting to talk that during their senior year about applying for a Fulbright grant. And I was like, oh, this sounds like a fantastic um, opportunity. I really do want to go um, back to the Czech Republic because during that short eight weeks, I realized how much the U.S. isn't necessarily teaching about certain parts of the world, including the Czech Republic, and how profound of an impact um, that they are in American history and vice versa. Um, so I really wanted to go back and give the Czech students an opportunity to kind of hear from the American lens um, as well as kind of learn a little bit more. So I was really fortunate to be able to go back. Um, I was interested in Fulbright because I did a lot of English uh, as a second language work here at PC. Um, I led the program as a sophomore and continued to volunteer throughout my years here. Um, and so after I graduated, I knew that I wanted to continue in that vein, um, teaching students and developing one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so the Fulbright seemed like a great opportunity to blend my love of writing and languages um, and traveling. And I chose Spain because I studied abroad there um, my junior year in the city of Sevilla, which is in the south. And so I knew that Madrid would be kind of a different urban cosmopolitan experience, um, and I was really excited to do that as well. Um, okay, so for me, it was my answer is I think you all had very like clean, clear cut answers. Mine's a, <laughs> a little bit messier in that um, you know early in my province college career, a professor had kind of said, "Hey, maybe you should think about Fulbright," and then I forgot about it for like two years. Um, and then I, graduation was approaching, and I realized I had to do something. Um, and so I kind of started talking to Dr. Mulderry and looking into Fulbright. Um, and when I was looking at countries I wanted to go to, I I knew I wanted Central Europe um, because I'd studied abroad in Italy, so I'd done a lot of like Southern and Western Europe, but I hadn't done a lot of Central Europe. Um, I needed a country where I did not have to know the language. Um, and the Czech Republic seems like a really good fit, just kind of logistically, um, in that they had a, num a good number of grants available. Um, and they did not expect you to know Czech. Um, and it was right in the heart of Central Europe. Um, but additionally, I was interested because in CIV with Dr. Mulderry, actually, um, we had talked about 
kind of the end of communism within the context of the Czech Republic. So when we talked about um, the end of the Cold War, we focused on that that specific country. Um, and so I knew a little bit about Czech history, which was really fascinating. Um, and what was really interesting to me as a theater major is that um, artists kind of led the charge um, and were a major part of the Velvet Revolution. Um, and then following the revolution, um, the Czech Republic's first president, um, Václav Havel, um, was actually a playwright. Um, so for a theater person, that's just a really fascinating history. Um, and I really wanted the chance to go um, and to learn more about that and kind of see what is it about this culture that kind of created that environment. Um, before I move on to the next question, and we, we, you know, we can start with you on the next question, that way we'll, we'll mix it up a little. You, you've probably already noticed by some of the things just said that some nations' English teaching assistantships require that you have some proficiency in the native language of that country. And there are some nations that require intermediate level or fluency. And then other nations will say right in the description for the Fulbright grant saying no proficiency required in the local language. But it's recommended that you start you know, learning a few words, um, especially once you get the grant, right? So um, to, if you or any of your loved ones ever plan on applying for a Fulbright, you need to know it's very nation and grant specific, and the website's fabulous. I'm gonna tell you about that at the end. And you can go and read the candidate profile for that particular nation, particular grants. There's nothing general about Fulbright. So, do, and you, you can already tell that. So, we're gonna start with you, Jen. Um, briefly, what did your, if you were an ETA, what did your duties and um, activities include in your placement in your nation? And for Emily, it'll be a little different. So you can tell them specifically where you travel to to do your research. Um, and then after everyone answers that question, the next question will be about their voluntary community engagement project. Remember I mentioned if you're an English teaching assistantship, it's 20 to 25 hours generally, and usually you do something outside that that's more tailored to your interests. So first, what did you do in your role as an ETA or a researcher, um, starting with Jen? Okay, well... Um I, I think good context to do. I'm talking about how regions are very grant specific. Um, in some regions, and you'll you'll hear this, um, you teach in secondary schools, um, and in in some places you teach at uni at universities, right? And so another reason I chose the Czech Republic is I wanted secondary school. Um, so I was teaching at a gymnasium, which is an uh, it's an eight year high school. Um, so it starts the youngest students are 11, the oldest are 19. Um, and it's kind of the the traditional like university preparatory um, school system, and so my duties as an English teaching assistant were, I would teach. I actually I taught a lot. Um, I had a very full schedule. I taught in, in nineteen classes per week, um, and so uh, I. But it was like each class I would only see once a week, and so I would go in. I would teach that entire class. Um, the teachers at my school pretty much gave me free reign and said, do whatever you want, just talk in English. Um, and so, which is no problem because I can't talk in Czech. Um, and, so they, um, and so they just kind of let me do conversation lessons trying to encourage students to speak because for Czechs, it's really important that they have English because there are only 10 million people in the world who speak Czech. Um, so they really need English um, for jobs. And there are very few companies that are Czech owned, um, so they need, they need language proficiency. Um, and so in addition to the classes, every single day after school, I had um, English conversation club. So it was differentiated by level. Um, and so kids who wanted to get extra practice would come in and we would just talk um, for another class period, basically, um, at the end of the school day. Um, and then I also had, um, a drama club, but I'll be honest, that one kind of, that was my initial plan in my, um, in my grant, and I kind of had it, um, but kids are really busy, right? And so towards the end of the year, that one kind of fell off, but I ended up adding, um, doing um, another kind of conversation group with older people in the community. Um, not a lot of older Czechs speak English, 
um, and the few who do, especially who live in small towns, don't get any opportunities to practice it. Um, so they found out about me and like started a bunch of these, this group of like old retired men um, started dragging me to their English conversation club that they'd have once a week. And it was really fun. I loved it. So. And um, follow Jen's lead, and why not talk about both? Talk about the sure. role in the school and community engagement. I think awesome. that's working great. Great. Um, so like Jen, um, I also knew that I wanted to teach um, in secondary or um, perhaps younger. In Madrid, there are a few placements um, that are in infantile, which is like two to five-year-olds. Um, I did not have that placement, but just so you know, is a possibility. Um, I taught in an instituto, um, which is like from 12 to 18. Um, I taught six English classes. Um, it was mostly English language and literature because that's what I really enjoyed doing. Um, but I also had fellow assistants who taught in biology, technology, gym, um, whatever aligned with their interests. My main responsibility as an ETA there um, was doing a program called Global Classrooms, which is like a model UN curriculum um, for the Comunidad de Madrid. Um, and they have many, many different schools who participate. And so my job was to teach my students a global classrooms curriculum that focused on social issues, issues of global concern, um, how to really dialogue with those subjects um, in their second language. And so my students amazed me every day because they had more articulate conversations about very complex issues um, than I could have today. Um, so I really enjoyed that part of it. And then outside of work, um, I did a couple different community engagement projects. Um, I worked with American Space Madrid, um, and those are spaces all over the world that um, United States embassies kind of put together um, and host. And so I worked there as a program assistant, um, doing dialogue programs for Spanish teens about twice a month. And then I also volunteered um, at a place called ASP, um, and I taught English classes there once a week um, because I knew that I wanted to continue in the ESL vein. And so I taught those classes to women who had recently immigrated to Spain from other countries and wanted to pick up the language um, in order to better their situation for their children and themselves. Um, yeah. Uh, very similar to Jen, I was also in a gymnasium. Um, mine was a traditional um, eight-year high school, but we also had um, some folks um, in the final four years focusing on early childhood education. So I kind of had a little bit of students very specified in early childhood and then others who were going to go on for engineering or history, um, fire prevention, what have you. Um, I also taught in 20 different classrooms every single week, 20 different lesson plans every week, um, which was really um, a fantastic opportunity. And I was very fortunate. Um, I was in a very small uh, village, although they'd probably be upset I called it a village. They always called it a large town. Uh, I'm like, ah, oh, not in America. Uh, but um, yeah, I was very involved and basically said whatever, you know, opportunities and field trips, so I'd go with them to English speaking and Czech speaking plays. Um, I chaperoned a trip to Belgium, um, which was really fantastic for an entire week. I went on a cycling trip that did not end super well, um, considering I hadn't been on a bike probably since I was 16, but it was um, a really um, fantastic opportunity to um, integrate myself in the classroom and have the Czechs know that while they were really uncomfortable trying to speak English to a native speaker, I was right there with them in the thick of things, doing things that made me super uncomfortable also, which kind of um, bridged the gap um, really nicely. Uh, similar to Jen, um, I initially really wanted to try to start up a conversation club, but um, because around me were, the villages were quite small, it's very different than in the U.S. where, okay, you live in a town and your high school is maybe 10 minutes um, away or relatively close. I had students commuting over an hour on public transportation pretty much every single day to get to school. So the second school got out, they were catching the train home. They weren't going to stay for an extra half hour, 45 minutes. So um, my conversation clubs with students um, and opportunities with them really ended up kind of being like, during the school day or on the weekends. Um, you know, I hiked all the way up to the top of Shanishka, which is the highest point um, in the Czech Republic. It's our tallest mountain kind of in the region where I was. So anytime opportunities like that kind of came up, we did have um, some of our local um, seniors, our Octava class, come and meet me quite often. And with them, I really worked with them for resumes, helping them find work opportunities um, in Iceland and Spain. Um, they really saw it as an opportunity of, you came all the way here from America to my small town. I want to get out of my small town and see the world too, which was really nice. 
Um, and then I also ended up kind of being uh, a tutor for some of my students' moms and some of the older um, women in the area, which was really a great way to kind of get their perspective because they really weren't, they didn't have the opportunity to learn English um, until much more recently in the Czech Republic, really after the Velvet Revolution. It was really kind of the option of uh, German or Russian. So a lot of um, the moms and older generations in the community wanted to learn. Um, and it was really just a great opportunity for them to kind of start having conversations. So I really enjoyed it. So um, I was also in Spain, as I said, but my placement was a little bit unique. Um, I was actually working at a university, and I did not know that I would be working at a university when I applied. So in my application, I actually thought I was going to be in global classrooms and tailored my uh, statements to uh, prepare for working with high school students. And what I didn't know is on the back end, they were experimenting with a pilot position in a university where they wanted to have basically a, an English teaching assistant that would serve as the writing center. So there was no writing center at this university. It's called IE University, and it is an international business school that exists in Madrid. And for many years, they offered only MBAs. And then in the mid-2000s, they opened an undergraduate program. And that undergraduate program, by the time I got there, was maybe a little bit less than 10 years old. And so when, uh, as Dr. Meldary mentioned earlier, they also, um, Fulbrights can be master's degrees as well. And so for many years, there was a Fulbright placement or rather position where you could earn a master's degree from IE. And so the coordinators at IE said, well, you also have these English teaching assistants we've been hearing about. We'd like to have one at our university, so we're going to pay for one. So they did. And so because it was more experimental, they didn't advertise it on the website. And so because I had an econ background, they told me later after I was there that they saw my econ background and thought it'd be a good fit for the university. So I was 23 years old working with students that were 18 to 22 years old. <laughs> so um, basically my role was to, as I said, serve as the writing center. And I'd say about 15 hours a week, 15 or 16 hours a week, I would actually set up one-on-one -on -one appointments with mostly first year students, but other years were welcome to come um, and walk them through whatever kinds of writing assignments that they were struggling with. So um, a lot of them came from different countries. I think the school was about 60% international. So there were, of course, a lot of Spanish students, but also students that came from, I think, up to 50, 50 different countries and about 50 different education systems as well. So um, helping them kind of adopt this Anglo-American writing style that some of them might not have been used to was part of my job and help them to help them get to uh, express themselves in English better. Um, in addition to working with the students in those one-on-one -on -one appointments, um, I also taught an evening faculty workshop for conversation. So this was a voluntary workshop, it wasn't a class, but these were um, adults working at the university who are mostly Spanish because they live locally, but the official language of the university is English. And so a lot of them were struggling with communicating in English regularly with students who were speaking to them in English. And so it was 90 minutes on, uh, 90 minutes twice a week, and there were two campuses. So 90 minutes in Madrid on Mondays, and then on Thursdays, I would go out to Segovia, which is about 30 miles northwest of Madrid. Um, and it was actually a former Dominican convent, which is uh, kind of like, I think it was built in the 13 or 1400s, and so over time it became a school, and then it was a school for boys, and then IE University bought it and turned it into a college. Um, so kind of a weird, and I didn't know that, that PC was Dominican when they picked me for this role, so that was kind of cool. Um, and so uh, that was kind of my main thing, was to do both those writing appointments as well as the evening conversation workshops, but then outside the classroom I did two things. So first, I started a language workshop series at the university because, again, I was the writing center and they never really had one before. And so I basically set up a monthly workshop on a different writing topic. So we would do things like citations or paragraphs or just things that students were definitely struggling with in the classroom that professors were telling me about. And I was like, okay, and we need to get them on the same page and offer some kind of opportunity for them to improve their writing in addition to those appointments. And then outside of school, I was doing um, tutoring with local Spanish students who were probably in the equivalent of like seventh or eighth grade. Um, when I signed up for this opportunity, I, I thought it was tutoring them in English. Turns out when I got there that I was tutoring Spanish students in Spanish. <laughs> so try doing math in Spanish, because that was not fun. Um, so these seventh graders are teaching me how to say all the math words. I think it was hysterical. So um, I really enjoyed it, though. I went there uh, probably like three hours a week outside of school. Um, and I really got to know, I felt that that was the opportunity for me to meet local people, because again, the university was international. So I was really grateful to meet people from different countries, 
but at the same time, I wasn't meeting as many Spanish people as some of my friends working in the high schools, and so the tutoring opportunity was a good way to get outside the, uh, get outside the classroom. So the um, research grant is a little bit different than how the ETA is set up, and I think it's a little bit more independent. Um, so how it works is with research, you have to be associated with an institution, and um, I was associated with the University of Buenos Aires, and um, it was a professor that I had when I studied abroad in Buenos Aires. Um, but because it was something that I was interested in researching and it wasn't really um, through the university, um, I had a lot of, I, I basically established what I wanted to do with the project, and I didn't have a ton of support through the institution um, because they weren't researching it. It was just something that I was doing on my own. I think that does depend on the research grant and the research topic, so I think it, it varies. Like, if you're doing something, I knew other uh, research students that were studying something that the university wanted to study, and so they had a lot of backing and maybe had, like, an office at the university and that kind of thing. But um, my project, I was studying access to water in um, a city outside of Buenos Aires called Claypole. Um, it's a lower income community and it's, it just borders the city of Buenos Aires. And so the city itself, the city of Buenos Aires has perfectly fine access to tap water and access to water and sewage infrastructure, all that. Um, this city, Claypole, does not. And um, that was what I was trying to study was why, why do they have poor access to water? Why are there sewage infrastructure? It's infiltrating the water networks. And they also had a pretty big industrial park um, in their community, which was also contaminating the water. So a lot of my um, research involved uh, pretty much like reporting and um, having interviews with the, the people that lived in Claibole and um, also the water officials, the people that um, were part of the municipality. I met with ISA, which is the water company um, in, in Buenos Aires, and talked to them about how, what they were doing to um, make more connections and address this problem. Um, so my work was a lot of just um, interviews and uh, collecting interviews and then transcribing the interviews. And I was writing in Spanish and in English, so I wanted to um, put the art, the what I was writing more in a um, a journalistic style instead of an academic style because I had already done an academic uh, sort of research paper when I had studied abroad around this subject. So I thought in order to get the problem exposed more, doing it in a journalistic way would be more useful to um, get other people in the in Buenos Aires to even address that this was a problem because that was one thing I was finding was that there was not a lot of knowledge about this and um, also there just was so much bureaucracy with like who's in charge of what, what water company, there were so many different elements. So um, I got involved, so with the ETA, um, the ETA scholarship, you do have to get involved in some kind of community that's part of the application, like some community service um, initiative. That's not the case for research. Uh, they recommend it, but it's not part of the application. So I worked a lot with this uh, workshop in Claypole called Tacher de Aguas, and they were um, a water workshop that um, they were trying to basically advocate for the community to get better access to water and better sewage lines. Um, so I, I did a lot of work with them, and they had other, other things going, like a, a kitchen for, um, a soup kitchen for lower income people in the community, and also a nursery, a daycare for uh, families that could bring their kids there when they were working. So um, I was there, uh, I would go to Claypole like once a week, and then the rest of the time I mostly was in the city of Buenos Aires writing or doing other interviews. Um, and then I also wanted to um, find a way to publish the articles, so I found an English-speaking newspaper in Buenos Aires called The Bubble, and I would go there as well once a week. And so that was kind of my version of uh, like replacing the time that would be for doing some type of community work, I was going to this um, this newspaper, and that's where I would like write my articles and like publish them. Um, and yeah, so that that took most of my time. It was very independent. Um, I think it was that was hard for me because I didn't have a super um, strong infrastructure to like that. It was very much my own initiative to um, pull off like my day to day activities. Um, but I think that depends on the um, the research that you do in the institution. So my institution was super hands-off, and so um, that, that's where I think we 
I, it sounds like there's consensus among that where it depends on the country and the place and everything where you, it kind of re requires a lot of flexibility and um, yeah, it, it just depends on a, a, like the place. So um, that was that was kind of what I got involved in. And um, then there's also other things that like I recommend as when you are in, in a country like doing other things for yourself like language activities. There's a bunch if you want to get better at the language. I got involved with like there were other language groups that would be working on like improving your Spanish like Spanish English chats that were very helpful but that's not necessarily a community activity but there that was something that I got involved in um, as well or like soccer clubs and like that kind of thing so um, those are always good outlets also for like cultural exchange so Nepal is very different from uh, doing an ETA grant in Europe um, and I recommend it because I love the country, uh, but instead of uh, working in a university, I was placed in uh, a government school, which we would call a public school here. In Nepal, a public school is a private school, so it was, it's hard to wrap your, <laughs> my head around that. Uh, and when I got to the school, I found out that the, the teacher I was supposed to be an assistant to uh, was gone. Uh, he was sick, so instead of being an English teaching assistant, I became a full-time English teacher, which I was not entirely prepared for at first, but I made it work. Uh, one of the exciting things about the Nepal program is that you don't have to know the language coming in, uh, because not a lot of Americans even know where Nepal is, so it would be hard to find a Nepali lesson somewhere around here. But they gave us a one-month language-intensive course before we started teaching, uh, which was really necessary because most of my students had almost no English. And so I really needed to have that language background that I had received like a month before to be able to work with them and kind of help create that bridge from Nepali to English. I taught grades one, two, and three. And then I helped out with uh, grades 9 and 10. And uh, the school week was Sunday to Friday, which was very weird to only have a one-day weekend. But, you know, you go with it. And there were so many holidays and festivals that I think I only actually had two full school weeks my entire time. Um, we had this one time, it was a, a three-week break. And I was like, what am I going to do with three weeks? So I went to the other Fulbrighters in other districts of Nepal. Uh, they did not have the three-week break, so I just taught at their schools. And it was a pretty wonderful uh, thing to do to see what their schools were like. But there was a lot of freedom, a lot of independence, because it's a hard country to get around. There's not a lot of infrastructure when it comes to English teaching, so you kind of make your own way. Uh, my classroom had benches, uh, desks, and a whiteboard, and that was it. There was no electricity, there was no internet, we didn't have a photocopier or a printer. All of my materials were handmade. I once made um, 50 handwritten tests for my students so that they couldn't cheat. Every test was different. And you just kind of have to learn how to adapt to uh, not having the technology that we're used to because not all of the schools and not all of the country placements for Fulbright are going to have, you know, the resources that we might expect for teaching. Um, but I, I also found time to do some community surface, uh, service. Sorry, It wasn't as structured as I would have liked, but uh, kind of through happy happenstance, I connected with a publishing company, a children's publishing company in Kathmandu, and taught um, writing workshops for them, and also a book illustration workshop I'm not an artist, but they're like, oh, you can do it. That's fine. Uh, and I also helped record an English testing CD. So somewhere in the country of Nepal, students are learning English to a CD of my voice reading <laughs> fairy tales. So it was just kind of a matter of finding ways that I could be useful, finding places that I, I could help out um, and, you know, kind of embracing that independence, embracing the ability to be creative, and it was really wonderful. 
Thank you. Um, I hope you're noticing it's really coming out in what our alums have said that the central qualification for becoming a Fulbrighter is that you show that you're going to be a good cultural ambassador in that place. And a lot of that is service. And a lot of it's just willingness to appreciate and dialogue and find opportunities for that exchange. And Emily mentioned, you know, go play soccer. It isn't just, again, accent on it isn't all about service. Um, it's, it's also about just opportunity to immerse and exchange. Okay, so the, we're going to have one more question, but it's really a double. Um, would you please tell um, our audience how Fulbright has influenced your career and or studies since? Um, and do you have any advice for anyone applying for a Fulbright? Okay, so how has it influenced you since? And do you have any advice to give? And um, we can start with you, Alana. Thanks. Uh, so I'll start with the advice. Uh, my first bit of advice is don't start your application three weeks before it's due. Uh, I did that. It's possible, but I would recommend, uh, you know, talking to Dr. Mulderry and kind of making a plan for yourself so you can really synthesize your personal statements and application and not feel totally crunched for time. Yes. <laughs> Don't start in September. <laughs> and another bit of advice is you have to really want it. You have to look at it as something that this is this is the only thing I want to do with my my time period after graduation because if you're only doing it because of the prestige or you're only doing it because it might be cool to get a free vacation um it's not going to be a fulfilling experience and you might kind of crumble and crack because it is stressful. It's it's hard to be away from family for so long and to not see your friends and maybe not be able to shower for three weeks, which is some problem that I had to deal with. <laughs> and if you have that passion driving you, that excitement of I am so happy to be here, I am so happy to be in this community, being a cultural ambassador, that will take you through all the hardships, all the tough times, and it will make you enjoy the beauty of it and the exciting parts of it even more. Um, and I guess how Fulbright has influenced my, my career, my studies moving forward, uh, kind of a two-part answer. I'll make it short. Uh, so I'm currently studying popular fiction writing and publishing at Emerson, uh, and I want to be a young adult writer. And that ties back into my community service in Nepal of seeing all these children who were not allowed to read for fun. They had to just study, 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 and they wanted to hear these stories and read these stories. And so I just want to bring those stories and those books into people's lives. And also, I mean, books are what inspired me to want to go out and see the world in the first place. So maybe one day I can write a book that will make other people want to do a Fulbright. But Fulbright has also taught me not to wait for things. If you want to go out and do something, if you want to climb Kilimanjaro or take your mom to Egypt or learn how to scuba dive in the Great Barrier Reef. Just go and do it because this world is so beautiful. There are so many incredible people out there. And Fulbright taught me that you can't just sit at home and think, oh, maybe one day I'll do that. You have to do it now. You, there are ways to do it. The Fulbright grant exists to give people the resources to do that. So go ahead and, and just go for it and try. That's awesome. I would entirely second what Alana just said, every part of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do think it is important to keep in mind that um, if you do receive the scholarship, it is challenging. And it's it was a very challenging year. Um, it's a lot of um, change and uncertainty, and you have to really be flexible. And that was probably the biggest takeaway that I, I got from the experience, um, just adapting and um so my recommendation, I guess, advice, I would also say start early. I did start the application in the summer going into senior year of college. And um, for the research grant specifically, my advice would be, like, don't be intimidated by the process of writing a research proposal. 
Um, I do think it's really important to spend a lot of time editing the proposal, and I did that. But um, also, it, you, it is important to realize that when you arrive in the country, things will change, and it will, you will have to adapt your plan. And so don't go in expecting that, oh, this research proposal is going to have to be X, Y, Z. It's going to be laid out perfectly, and that's going to go how it goes. It doesn't work that way. And I, from most research grantees I've heard, it never goes as it's stated in your research proposal. So <laughs> um, just accept that. And it's, But that doesn't mean don't try and make it sound like the perfect research proposal you want to make when you're applying. I think that is important. Um, and then as far as affecting my career choices, I think Fulbright really uh, influenced, influenced me because I ended up staying in Argentina um, a year and a half or almost two years after the Fulbright ended. So I lived in Buenos Aires for three years and then uh, I was working at a political risk um, group in Buenos Aires and that was amazing. Um, and a great experience. I left because I would have stayed. <laughs> I left because the economy is really bad right now there, and it was very difficult to, it wasn't a very sustainable place to live forever. Um, but it did inspire me to, like Alana said, you just get up and do it. And just, I mean, I think it, it took Fulbright to t have me take the jump to like just go abroad and do it. And, um, and then it now I it's totally something that I would do again. It's not it doesn't sound as daunting to go live abroad or do this thing or whatever. It, it makes everything so much easier. And so after after Argentina, I then end up living in in Dublin in Ireland for almost a year. And so after graduating PC, I pretty much have been living abroad for four years. And now I'm just back in the states and I'm in Philadelphia and um, I'm studying city planning. And I do attribute a lot of my inspiration for city planning to my experiences living in various cities. And um, I was really inspired by, so I'm specifically interested in public transportation and um, transit modes, biking, and accessibility, ped pedestrian ways and all that. Um, so I, I realized that I was... I was so spoiled living in Buenos Aires by amazing public transportation. It was super affordable, super efficient, frequent, and fast. And then I moved back to the States. and I, Well, I moved to Dublin, and then I moved back to the States. And I was very frustrated by the fact that our public transit is not like up to par, in my opinion. Um, and so that inspired me to pursue city planning and ways to, um, to address that. And so I... I am very grateful to my experience in Fulbright for allowing me to make the jump to be in Argentina and then also learn um, from that to take me where I am now. So I would definitely echo what they said about starting early. But the one thing that I would add to that is also make sure you know your story. And so make sure that you're crafting your story and picking your recommenders and expressing yourself in a way that justifies and you know relates to why you want to go to that particular country. Um, I felt like that was kind of something that helped me thinking through, okay, why, why did I pick my recommender for this particular grant? And so that was a helpful way to think through it. Um, but in terms of uh, career, so while I was over there, as I said, I work with students from over 50 education systems. And so I had, a, had an interest in public policy vaguely before I went there, but working with students from all these different education systems made me a lot more interested in education policy. And so um, I actually had a professor here who completed a Master of Public Policy degree, Dr. Eve Belize Moran. And um, she went, also went to Duke University, and so we spoke about her experience, and it just felt like a really good fit for somebody who had an econ background, and then especially being in Fulbright, learning about the education systems of other countries and the students that um, are affected by the decisions that governments make about their education systems uh, made me want to pursue a Master of Public Policy degree. So um, I did not formally specialize in education policy in my degree program, but I definitely took a lot of electives, and I wrote some master's research about education policy as well. Um, but um, in addition to that, I'd say now as a uh, government consultant, you might think, what does Fulbright have to do with that? I would say one thing that I took away was that I'm a much more empathetic listener and learner. And so I might not always agree with my colleagues or my clients about the decisions that they make, but being in Fulbright makes you that empathetic cultural ambassador. And so when I work with in groups and I work with uh, leaders and I work with clients, I have a better sense of why people might say or do the things that they do. Um, and so I thought that was a good takeaway from my year.
I think the biggest thing for me, especially through the application process, and if you are awarded a grant, is always to remember your why. Um, I was one of 20 um, grantees in the Czech Republic my year. Um, we were all about two and a half hours apart, so I really was near no other Americans, and we were all in very vastly different schools, um, different cities, and when we would get together and you're hearing about other people's experiences, some folks in my group were like, oh, I wish I was in a bigger city, like, oh, I'm so jealous, and they were stopping to and not appreciating that the fact that they were still awarded a grantee and they were influencing people's lives and you were in, and your life was being influenced. Um, and everyone's going to have a very vastly different experience. Um, and we should always be very appreciative of it. I was fortunate enough, me and Abby got together um, in Europe. They have um, like a mid-year European um, conference in Berlin. And we had very vastly different experiences. Um, and I think it's just an opportunity to appreciate that you are part of a larger network. Um, but at the end of the day, to always remember why you want to go to that country. Um, and, you know, I kind of always had my, like, essay on my desktop. And anytime I was having a tough day, I kind of just go through and read it again and remember why. And I did start my application very early in June before going into senior year. <laughs> I like 30 different drafts, um, you know, why I wanted to do this. Um, uh, Fulbright taught me I absolutely did not want to teach. I actually hated teaching, <laughs> um, but I loved working with my students, especially on a one-on-one -on -one level, having those deeper conversations. So um, by the time I realized I wanted to get back into higher ed, that was kind of my passion. Before Fulbright, um, a lot of the deadlines passed, which was kind of um, by good nature because then I actually got to come back to PC for the past two years. Um, worked in career services. I got to work a little bit and study abroad. I got to help out with Dr. Mulderry. Um, with the grantees. I mean, just last year we had a student walk in, just happened to be her career coach. I'm looking over her resume early September. I was like, have you thought about a Fulbright? And she's actually one of the ones who's um, on a Fulbright um, experience right now. So it really has been a great full circle thing. Um, and I'm very fortunate now that I'm at uh, Merrimack College. I actually went in for a different position in admissions. And then during my final round interview, the director sat down with me and she's like, you do realize that we are recruiting for an uh, international admissions counselor that we would really like to hire you for. I was like, oh, I didn't even know that was on the website. Absolutely. Uh, sign me up. So um, I'll actually be traveling to Mexico starting at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Um, so I get to work with um, international students from Mexico, Europe, and Canada who wish to kind of pursue their studies in the United States. And I'll also be working um, with our honors um, applications. And then in the spring, really start to help Merrimack build up um, their Fulbright um, profile and existence on their campus. So it's really great that everything I'm kind of doing is still has a pulse back to Fulbright. Um, I echo what everyone has said um, about advice. Uh, listen to feedback from the committee um, as well. I think that I did about 20 different drafts of my personal statement and statement of grand purpose um, and the feedback that they gave me uh, was instrumental, I think, in securing me a grant. Um, so thank you, Dr. Mulder, for those emails the night before they were due that said, do you want me to look over this one more time? Um, always say yes um, if those emails come your way. I have five office hours tomorrow yeah. because the, the applications this fall are due Tuesday. So yeah. Yeah. we have 16 applicants this year. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, as far as impacting me, um, Fulbright really had a large impact on where my career has gone um, since getting back to the States. Like Kelly, uh, I discovered that I loved education, but that I did not love classroom teaching. Uh, I'm in awe of teachers who manage classrooms every day. Um, classroom management was not for me. Um, but I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one relationship work um, while I was at PC. Um, I did a lot of peer ministry, um, and so I knew that one-on-one -on -one relationships was what I wanted to get back into. Um, one of my students, we were at like a final event for Global Classrooms, and it was held at the kind of equivalent of Madrid's town hall. Um, and he said to me, like, Abby, because of this program, like, I can see myself inside of this building one day um, as a legislator. And having those kinds of interactions with students was something that I knew I wanted to continue to have. Um, and so when I got back to the States, um, I was looking for jobs in education, um, and came across the nonprofit sector, um, which is very different from what I had thought I would do when I came back. Um, I wanted to get into publishing for a long time. Um, but the nonprofit that I work for now is a great mix of building those one-on-one -on -one relationships um, and helping students 
achieve the next step in their lives. I will keep this very short. Um, my advice is that if you are lucky enough to get a Fulbright, when you are there, if someone asks you to do something, you say yes, okay? Um, and just get used to saying yes, even if the invite sounds super weird um, and you have no idea what you're getting into. Um, and I mean, I'm freshly out, but the way Fulbright has impacted my career, I am still a teacher. Um, contrary to Kelly and Abby, I fell in love with teaching um, while on Fulbright. And even though the challenges of teaching in an urban public school are very different from the challenges of teaching in the Czech Republic, um, what being in the Czech Republic and what Fulbright taught me um, was adaptability and resilience. Um, and just the ability to every day say, I'm here, I'm committed, I'm doing this, um, and it's going to be okay. I'll make it work. Um, so that's all I have. We have a round of applause for these incredible human beings. <laughs> really, really, really inspiring. They've all agreed to share their email addresses. Um, so if there's anyone here who's thinking of applying and wants to um, communicate with any of our panelists, please do so. I'm hoping they'll allow us to edit down this video and make little short video clips for applicants. Um, and I misspoke earlier just because of these long days. We have two people going to Spain this coming year and one to Malaysia, not two to the Czech Republic. That was the year before, including Jen. I'm just mixed up. Anyway, thanks again for coming early on a Saturday. This was really a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Providence College Podcast. You can find all our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts, and please rate, review, and subscribe. You can always email the show at podcast at providence.edu.